my assignment this morning comes from a very familiar passage of scripture. For the next few minutes, we're going to consider the book of Job, 23rd chapter. And then I say, sir, I'm chapter at the 10th verse. And as we search for a particular scripture, we're going to petition our help. Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord God, we've come to the preaching hour in this worship experience. We ask that the preacher come in the person of the Holy Spirit. Remove me, kind sir, decrease me and increase in me. Hide me behind the blood-stained cross. Let the words of my mouth, meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. And all of God's people said, amen, amen. Again, Job 23 and the 10th verse, and it reads, He knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. The word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Beloved, I've entitled this sermonic exercise, I Shall Come Forth. I shall come forth. I ask you pray with me and pray for me. Still getting things back together, standing, be challenged when my throat can be challenged. God is still able. God is still able. Beloved, what a theological examination and analyzing different books of the Bible and its chapters provides a profound understanding of the spiritual message and its application to our lives. One such text, Job 23, does just that this morning. It offers forth a profound insight into the power dynamics between God and mankind, particularly in the context of suffering. And suffering. Now, we know Job is the character who was a man who was upright and who eschewed evil. See, a lot of us like to run to evil, but Job stayed away from evil. And it's marked down, he's marked down in history as a man who experienced immense suffering, yet maintained his faith in God. What a powerful testimony. And so through an examination of this 10th chapter, we're going to explore and understand in our everyday existence how God can help us. Am I making sense? I want you to know today that in what you may be experiencing, abandonment or abuse, sorrow or loss, fears and failures, setbacks and confrontations, chronic illness and pain, the list goes on and on. But we all hurt for a variety of reasons. Sometimes God's hand of comfort and his compassion towards us in our pain and sorrow is sometimes readily available, excuse me. See, it appears that our point of need, when God shows up with his provision, his peace, and his power, we can't feel it. Sometimes when we suffer, we don't know where God is. We don't know what he's doing and why he's doing it. A lot of times, beloved, we ask, why me? That ain't the right question. I said, that is not the right question. For a baptized believers, we should be asking, Lord, what's your will in this? How can your name see, receive the glory in this? And what's my lesson in this? Because see, what God wants us to do, he wants us to grow and to know that he's able. Y'all ain't helping me. He wants us to know who he is and whose we are in him. Beauty of it is this. Life has been something. Uh, Use as an analogy of a uh, ship being in the ocean. And the beauty of the ship being in the ocean, as long as the ship is in the water, everything is all right. But once the water gets in the ship, once life starts happening, then there's some things you got to think about. And want a holy God to come to your side. Am I making sense? You see, what God has done with each of us, he's given us a ministry. A ministry and suffering. For the Bible declares we must suffer and endure hardness like a good soldier. 
In other words, we have our assignment. It's not going to be on flowery beds of ease like Dr. Watts says, but we've got to keep going through with peace, perseverance, and his presence. See, without any contest, there's no conquest. Some of us only pray when it gets bad. Or some of us only pray when it's good. Let me say it that way. See, he didn't want us just to pray when the sun is shining. When the storms of life are raging, that's when we know holy God is going to come to our side. Am I making sense? See, listen, it's like times when our faith is challenged. Not like a jump rope competition, but like wrestling a gorilla. Listen, you can jump rope all day long if you got the stamina. But when you're wrestling a gorilla, you ain't got no chance of winning. And sometimes that's what life does to us. It beats us up from all angles and all things and all sides. But we're supposed to endure. We're supposed to maintain. Have you ever had those times? Have you ever been to a point where you've been so far with your back left an imprint? Have you ever been in a place where you don't know where to turn or what to do? Can't cry. Can't talk. Can't scream. Nothing. But God. But God. And so as we look at our text as I hurry on, in that verse 1, in the last chapter in 22, once his friends Eliphaz came with their attacks, Job ignored him and still tried to petition God. His complaint was that he didn't understand what the purpose of his trials was. So he wanted to talk to God. He wanted to confront God. He wanted to ask God, why me? Listen, I've been doing the right thing. Can I say that? I've been praying, not for me, but for mine. I've been giving up the good in me. And I make sure that I don't do anything to support myself but to give your name the glory. But see, what happens to us is that once things start happening, we start to complain. We don't start to seek God's counsel in his word. We want to understand why from our natural selves. We got to realize that our help is supernatural. It's out of this world. <laughs> we got help that's going to help us when we can't help ourselves. Sometimes through our trials, Jesus offers his compassion, his fellowship, his advocacy, his belonging, his sanctification, love, and peace. Yes, he does. See, sometimes we can't feel it we're so consumed with our own stuff. Can I let you in on a secret? Your present reality is not your only reality. Pastor told us last week that we live in three iterations. We're in a storm, we're going out of a storm, or we're coming into a storm. Amen? And storms are just a way of life. And sometimes we've got to face them head on. And realizing that when we ask God's questions, it's not a problem. Do you realize that on the cross, Christ asked his father, why has he forsaken him? He needed to know and understand why the anguish had come on him. He who was sinless took on the sin debt of the world. Am I making sense? God can do the impossible if we allow him. And so we see Brother Job. We see Brother Job. And in our text, we see that Job has questions that he wanted to wrestle with God, and he wanted God to answer. But we see that it says, listen, he couldn't find him. He couldn't find where God was and what God was doing. Isn't that like us sometimes? Always questioning where God is at and what he's doing. See, we didn't have those same questions. We were out there cutting up. <laughs> we didn't ask where God was, but we went where he shouldn't have gone. Amen. But the beauty of God never leaves us nor forsakes us. You know, Lisa, if I hurry on talking about this Job person, let me The Bible declares that Job was a very wealthy man. A right and Satan claimed that Job was only righteous because he was rich. You know, he had an accuser. Satan accused Job. It was sure Job would curse God to his if the Lord removed his hedge from around him. God accepted that challenge. And as a result, Job 
the crossfire of a cosmic bet. Yes, he was in the crossfire of a cosmic bet. You see, the Lord lifted the hedge of protection from around Job's life, and Satan attacked Job's life. One day, Job was ambushed by the unexpected. He received bad news. At the end of the day, Job had lost everything. All of his possessions were taken. All of his servants were murdered. All of his children died in a freak storm. And blood, don't understand the story of Job. See, if all you've seen the story of Job is Job, you ain't read the story. In the story of Job, we've got to see ourselves. We've got to see ourselves and what it is this life has done for us and is doing to us. You see, the book of Job is really a test of a true faith. It makes us question why we believe what we believe and what it is that we do believe. Am I making sense? You see, a lot of times we only want to enjoy God when things are going easy, when ain't nothing hard, when everybody's liking me and my pockets are full. But life. There are times, things, and situations that would make you question your own sanity. Asking, why did I do this or why did I do that? Amen. And with the right energy and the right pressure, you'll do almost anything. Beloved, we got to stop saying what we ain't going to do. With the right kind of energy and motivation, you're liable to do anything. I know it's going to get quiet. Listen, the beauty of this is that based on who and what we're facing. The old church, we used to say, prayer is good in a prayer meeting, but what about a bear meeting? <laughs> what happens when you face to face with a bear? You can't pray yourself away. You got to do something about it. Am I making sense? Are y'all praying with me? And so Job's complaints were viewed as an act of rebellion. His friends viewed his acts as a direct result of God's will, not God's will, but misguided free will. What am I saying? They said he was because he was a sinner. Now, they weren't wrong because we're all born in sin and shaped in iniquity. Amen. What happens with us is that we get to be too holy. Once we learn a couple of scriptures, we forget where we came from. Come on now. Even in this sanctified place, we don't get along. God's blessings are still being poured out on us. Amen. Am I right about it? And so Job's crew didn't care about his agony. They wanted to make sure he was all right. Now, I don't talk about Eliphaz and the other brothers too bad because at least they showed up. Now, they were there. They were just saying the wrong thing. The beauty of support, beloved, is sometimes you ain't got to say nothing. Just be there. So in his agony, Job cursed the day that he was born. He even complained that God failed to show him true justice. Oh, I cry in violence, but I get no answer. I shout for help, but there is no justice. George, Job poured out his heart to God and asking where God was. Just like David, who poured out his heart to God during his trials, and when he couldn't understand the reasons for his trials, Psalm 13. And says, how long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? Isn't that a powerful prayer? Sometimes I ask God, Lord, what's happening? What's going on? Help me understand. Thank you, sir. Help me understand. And then when I understand, help me do what's right. See, part of the problem is we talk to God, but we don't listen to God. Praise God we show up in the church house Sunday after Sunday. Amen. Praise God we're giving of our time, talent, and treasure. Amen. Praise God that we try to pick up his word and read it and love it for on a regular basis. Amen. But see, God knows what we need before we ask him. And your secret pain, he already knows about it. It didn't take him by surprise. But I want you to know this morning, beloved, that there is a ministry in the midst of your trial. Because what God is doing to you is trying to show you that he's still able, that he's still sovereign, and he can do anything but fail. Amen. Amen. You see, when the world turns against us, Jesus offers us his comfort, 
his love and his compassion, we must be like Christ. When we show compassion on others, we're most like him. For the Bible declares, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, hallelujah, who comforts us in our time of affliction. That's good to know. That's good to know that once I'm going through, he's going to go through with me. Amen. So, beloved, Job felt as though he had lost God's fellowship in his life. He was heartbroken. You see, once he felt God's presence when he prayed, and now he couldn't feel his presence any longer or get a sense of God's guidance. Can you imagine what happens when you don't know where God is? When you don't know what he's saying or what he's doing? Theologian Omri Nowen calls it a dark night. He said, listen, he had served and loved and given his support for so long, but when he needed God, he couldn't find him. Isn't that a powerful commentary? That we that God is there, but we can't feel his presence. That when we know that he's there and he's been there, but we don't know where he is, how he came to our aid. But I want you to know, we've just got to and mark time. He said he'd never leave us nor forsake us. And he's going to our side with his comfort, with his fellowship, advocacy. He advocates for us in heaven. Hallelujah. Right now, he's the Father interceding on our behalf with his compassion, his fellowship, and his advocacy. And I want you to know what God does, beloved. He wants us to be, quote, unquote, successful in this life. All that means is being a sold-out witness for him. That's all that means. He wants us to be completely and utterly sold out for him. And how do we get sold out for him? By giving ourselves to him. Wholly, completely, and totally. Beloved, I go to my seat with this. I go to my seat with this. A long time ago man sinned in the garden. And justice called a summit meeting in heaven, and justice said, man has sinned. What must we do about it? Justice said, let the wages of sin be death. But just then, Jesus broke into the conversation and said, yes, let the wages of sin be death, but the gift of God, eternal life. And he's I'll pay the price, and I'll give the gift. He told Justice to go down on Calvary and wait on him a while. Justice sat down on Calvary waiting on Jesus. And the Bible says that it was one Friday. Jesus went up to Calvary. He climbed that hill, hung between a souring heaven, sinning earth. Died until death died. Died until the account was settled. Died until the price was paid in full. Died until hell got tired. Died until justice was satisfied. Died until it was well with my soul. He died. Didn't he die? But I'm here to tell you it wasn't a passive death. For even then as he hung there on the cross, his spirit went walking down through the bowels of the earth looking for men and women of faith who had gone on before. And the first man he saw was Abel. And he said, Abel, what are you looking for? Abel said, I'm looking for the perfect sacrifice that would take away the sins of the world. Went on around a little further, and he ran into Enoch. And he said, Enoch, what are you looking for? Enoch said, I'm walking by faith, and I'm looking now to see him face to face. Went around a little further, and he ran into Noah. And Noah, he said, what are you looking for? Noah said, I'm looking for that ark that will see us safely through the flood. Yeah. Went around a little further. He ran into Ezekiel. He said, Ezekiel, what are you looking for? Ezekiel said, I'm looking for the wheel in the middle of the wheel. Went around a little further. Ran to Jeremiah. He said, Jeremiah, what are you looking for? Jeremiah said, I'm looking for the bomb of Gilead that will take away the sins of the world. Went around a little further, ran to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, better known as Shadrach, Meshach, 
and Abednego. He said, hey, boys, what are you looking for? They said, we're looking for the fourth man that showed up in the fire first. Went around a little further, ran to Hosea. He said, Hosea, what are you looking for? Hosea said, I'm looking for the perfect love, the unconditional love. Went around a little further, ran to Hosea. Isaiah, he said, what are you looking for? Isaiah said, I'm looking for the Prince of Peace, the wonderful counsel, the mighty God, the everlasting Father. And then Jesus turned around and said, I am he. I am the perfect sacrifice. I am the ark. I am the wheel. I am the balm of Gilead. I am the fourth man. I am the perfect love. I am the Prince of Peace, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God. Then he turned around and said, give me the keys. Give me the keys to the grave, death, sin, and sickness. And early, early, early that third day morning, he got with all power of heaven and earth in his hands. And right now, sitting at the right hand of the Father, saying, whosoever will, let him come. And that's why we shall come forth. Come on, let's give God a hand clap and pray. Come on, let's bless the Lord in this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.